Hello, my name is Paulo Redondo and today we're going to be talking about Gentle's Taxonomy. Uh, beginning part of this video, we're just going to go over exactly what that is and second half we're going to do some exercises and give us some examples on exactly how to use that and how to use the classification method that we got going on here. So to kick things off, uh, I drew up the Gentile's Taxonomy on the board here. As you can see, there's a lot going on, but all this is is a method of trying to classify motor patterns and, uh, and movements and exercises. Starting from the outsides, we're going to talk about action function and environmental context. So if you want to look at this as an X and Y axis, on the X axis, we're talking about action function. And on the Y axis, we're talking about environmental context. And everything just kind of shrinks in from here to classify these boxes. So we got under action function, we're talking about two big categories, body stability and body transport. And all that really means is body stability, we're not really moving. Body transport, we're physically moving from point A to point B. So I'm somehow getting there, whether it's a jump, a walk, uh, there's various ways to do that. So stability, transport. Uh, under that, those two categories, we got two more subcategories is either are we using an object or we're not using an object, object manipulation. So I have that listed here. On, back on the y-axis, we're talking about environmental context. Really all that's adding to the conversation is what is the environment doing around me? Uh, when we got this listed here, it's listed as stationary regulatory conditions. So that's the first half of this and in motion regulatory conditions. So stationary regulatory conditions, all that means is um, everything is stationed around in the environment. There's nothing really going to inhibit me from doing the action so I don't have to really pay attention on things that are happening around me while I'm doing this exercise. So like, for example, squatting in the gym, there really shouldn't be anyone coming to bother you while you're squatting in the gym, like pushing you over or anything like that. So we, all we have to do is focus on the movement. Unlike maybe uh, playing in a soccer game, there's a lot of things happening in the environment. That would be an in-motion regulatory uh, section of, of this uh, diagram. So those are the two big categories. And then the last two on this side, you have no intertrial variability and intertrial variability. So all that means is if we have no intertrial variability, that means the movement or whatever we're doing, the practice should be the same outcome every time. So like a squat, like we said earlier, every squat should roughly look the same. Uh, on an intertrial variability where it does have it, uh, you don't really expect the same outcome every time. So maybe uh, a better comparison would be running outside on the street on a flat surface. That's pretty much going to look the same no matter what uh, versus maybe running in the sand or running in shallow water. That's an unstable surface or maybe running on a hiking trail. You have rocks and twigs and sand is already uneven as it is. So the running and what your body has to do in that moment is going to be very unstable so you're going to have inter-trial variability, a variation in the, in the trial. So now that we know all that, we can now sum that up just like we would read a regular graph in math and put these things in these categories from 1A being the simplest on here to 4B to being the most complex. However, uh, this was not really designed to show one movement is harder than the other necessarily. It's just saying that uh, compared to like 1A to 4D, you're gonna have more variables of the things that we just talked about. So you're gonna be having, uh, especially 4D is gonna have a lot of these components. You're gonna have an object that you're manipulating. You're going from point A to point B. You will have intertrial variability and the environment's in motion. So you're having all those components rather on the opposite spectrum when we're going to 1A. You don't have an object you're stable, um, the trial should be, uh, there should be no intertrial variability and everything should be stationary. So there's not a lot to worry about here. So what a lot of people will do on their examples is 1A is usually you're just standing there and 4D is usually you're playing like in a soccer game or a football game where there's a lot of things going on. So that's pretty much it. So everything in between is a little gray sometimes so it's hard to, to really put this in perspective uh, especially for us coaches, um, where we're usually used to going one step at a time. These are really confined, even though we have a lot of variables here. Uh, so it is a little tough to progress on these things, but we will give some examples right now. So uh, going along right ahead, I'm going to use this first level here. 
from the section one and we're gonna go one at a time. So one A, as I said before, a lot of people just like using standing. I uh, just gonna change that up just a bit and uh, compare it to athletes. So if I'm taking a one A and say I have a kid that we're just starting off, the first thing I'm gonna do is teach them how to do an athletic stance. So just shoulder width apart, feet slightly out, quarter squat here, and right here is gonna be the beginning of a lot of movements. So as far as uh, Gentile's taxonomy goes, 1A, I'm stable. There's nothing in the environment that should be affecting this. I'm standing still. Uh, there's no object. So 1A, pretty simple. So we're gonna use that to progress in our movement here. And 1B, I'm gonna introduce uh, a medicine ball. So that's gonna be our object, right? For 1B, object being medicine ball. So we're gonna take that athletic stance here and we're gonna introduce a med ball chest pass. So here, athletic stance, and we're gonna push out. I can engage legs too, but I don't wanna throw this through my garage door. But that being 1B, we introduce the object, uh, the intertrial variability, there should not be none. That should pretty much be the same every time. And it's still stationary, so that's 1B. 1C, we have a, a broad jump. So we have to go back to eliminating the object. So no object, except now we're on the other side of the, of the chart here where we have to introduce body transport. So I'm going from point A to point B. So back to athletic stance, and we're gonna wind up here and we're gonna jump as far as we can out and land in our athletic stance. So I'm going from point A, point B, but we're still moving along this chart. So we were one C there at that broad jump. So no object, but we're doing body transport. Now last one here, one D, I'm gonna put it all together. So we're gonna introduce back the med ball for our object. Athletic stance, pick up our med ball, and we're going to do a med ball chest pass as we're broad jumping. So using that momentum for both, loading up here in our athletic stance, pushing off, <laughs> jumping off as far as we can at limited space here. But that's incorporating all four uh, parts here. So we have our object. Uh, we have still no hitch of tri variability that should look the same every time. Uh, the environment should be stationary. And yeah, so that's our first progression. So that's gonna wrap up our video. Uh, we went from 1A to 1B here. Um, when using Gentile's taxonomy, you can go from, I've seen people go 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D. Since movements are in vast amounts, you can really use this to your favor. It just has, it's really a tool to use in order to categorize these movements so you can better visualize progressions. That's all this is really about, is how are we gonna progress or regress a movement? And we just did a simple progression um, and yeah, thank you for watching.